that's our desire, our heart's prayer, is that God would bring our hearts nearer ever to him. Uh, in the light of all that's taking place, uh, not a very encouraging scene, quite frankly, it's a very discouraging scene every time you watch the news recently. Uh, we are thankful that in spite of that, the true, genuine, authentic Christian uh, has somehow what you call an escape that is a place where we can find a rest for our souls and that is exactly to be near to the heart of God. Okay, so thank you uh, Sister Coy for that uh, solo instrumental and uh, anybody can name that tune about the Tuni Sister Coy. He leaded me and I hope he is indeed leading you as we continue our early soldier. All right, we are looking and we've been looking at key passages of scripture that talk about the Lord's any moment we turn, passages that talk about uh, uh, current events and how they relate to biblical prophecy and uh, therefore, uh, like I said, ever since the turn of the year, 2020 and the turn of the decade, it appears to me that it's almost like we're living in a different world. Things are just happening one after the other at an escalating pace that it cannot be denied by anyone that uh, we are living in perilous times. The Bible calls it the last days. And while this could be discouraging to many for the believer, the Bible says when we see these things taking place, Jesus said, look up, not lock up, <laughs> look up for your redemption draweth nigh. So our text this, e this morning, uh, before we shift our series, is in, found in Titus chapter 2. So let's turn our Bibles there, please. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15 for our morning text. So shall we stand up please as we read this portion of scripture responsibly. Titus chapter 2, 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that having confidence for us, we should be disorderly, righteously, and godly in Jesus Christ our Lord looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify us to himself, a people, save us from the words. Verse 15, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let and no man despise thee. Father in heaven, again, thank you for your word, both the word incarnate to die for our sins, <laughs> and rose for a justification in the word inspired, given to us by men who were moved by no less than the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we listen to the preaching and teaching of it, we pray that give us hearts that are ready to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We ask for your Holy Spirit's illumination so that we will not only understand, but also see its ready application in every area of our life. We thank you for your answer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So, uh, as I pointed out, the world's problems are apparently compounding one after the other, both in the local and in the global scene. There is no denying, you know, every time we watch the news nowadays, uh, we hear of the coronavirus. And then Israel, and then, of course, tension between America and uh, Iran or the Middle East countries, the Muslims, Muslim nations, and all of these escalating. Of course, China is never out of the picture as well. So all of these, we find, have a place in biblical prophecy. Well, so far, we cannot specifically say that this, the current events are specifically fulfilling a specific passage, we can know for sure that these are all setting the stage for the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We've seen that uh, we are seeing a domino effect, for instance, uh, on the coronavirus outbreak. Tourism, of course, is driving in its deepest low. Businesses are threatening shutdown. 
uh, the situation uh, threatening to shut down the situation the economy is expected to go down to go downturn at the worst in human histories even worse than 1929 and considering China is said to be an economic powerhouse inflation is apparently inevitable locusts have you heard of that locusts in Africa Palestine, India, beginning to get worldwide attention, calamities such as earthquakes, floods, volcanic eruptions taking place everywhere, animal diseases like the African swine fever are spreading, tensions between world powers are ever escalating, particularly involving Israel and the Middle East, and all of this escalating, increasing and in fact, just like uh, when a, cha a woman or a mother gives birth to a baby, I don't know if you've been to a Lamas, my wife and I had a Lamas with almost all of our children, and that's when we record the uh, contractions of the baby in the mother's womb. And as the womb, as the baby is closer to its delivery, those contractions that are happening in the mother's baby their, their intervals get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until the baby finally is, is, is out. Okay? And that's what we're seeing. Okay? It used to be more often, maybe towards the weekend, medyo mahuhu pa ang balita. Because pa na opisina, etc. And then, ngayon, tuloy-tuloy. It seems that those intervals are slowly getting shorter and shorter and this is exactly what the Bible predicts. Why do you think the Bible tells us that this whole world will eventually face the wrath of God in a period of seven years? <clears throat> That's very short. Seven years. The seven year tribulation period. Especially the last half of the seven year tribulation period is the, what Jesus himself calls the great tribulation one calamity after the other, one judgment after the other, to the point that men in general, who especially those who do not want to know Christ, or want, who do not want to receive Him as Savior, will all the more, instead of turn to God, will all the more curse God and rebel against Him. So these are all undoubtedly coming to eventual, an eventual halt. Something or someone has to give. So the one can, cannot help but ask, are we at the end of the world? And I'm really convinced that we are closer to the Lord's coming than we probably ever think. All of these are predicted in Scripture, yet the worst is yet to come. Current events are merely setting the stage for biblical prophecy to be literally fulfilled during the tribulation period. Uh, also called in the Bible the time of Jacob's trouble or the 70th week of Daniel. Now while the world is wallowing in despair, in terror, in fear, aren't you glad that you are a born again Christian? I hope you are. I hope you know that this world is not our home. Our hope is not in government. Our hope is not in education and militarization. Because our hope is in the Lord as the hymn writer wrote. So although we live in this present evil world, we are looking for, as Paul said, and are expecting that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us in verse 12 that people are without hope. Without Christ, you are without God and without hope. But those who are in Christ, we have found our hope already in him see so that's why even as early as the first century the apostle paul was looking for expecting for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing and if he was looking for it way back 20 centuries ago mm -hmm. uh, way back 2000 years ago rather then all the more should we be looking for it even today so the Christian, if you are a believer, you and I need not despair, but should be living above the depressing circumstances. You why? Why? Because God, who cannot lie, has given us, believers, a blessed or a happy hope. That word blessed is the Greek word makarius. It means happy. It's a happy hope. 
So if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, you are a born-again child of God, and you have that blessed hope burning in your heart, then in spite of all the, the bleak news and the black news around us, is we should be happy. We should be, we need to that people are contacting uh, the coronavirus and the wars are escalating and people are dying. No, hindi na kinatutuwa natin. Pero siya sabi ng Bible, because these things are escalating, we know that the Lord's coming is near. And can you imagine, do you really believe that? That's the question. We say we believe the truths of the Bible, but do we really believe that the Lord's coming is ever so near? That it is indeed a blessed hope, because if we really believe that, then you will believe exactly what Paul said. It is a happy hope. No one else but the Christian can face the, this world and in the times in which we live, not in fear, but in faith. Because we know that God's truth is in fact marching on. And as a Christian, we know we are on the winning side. I hope you know that as a Christian. So, you know what? What's next in God's timetable? So, in other words, we're seeing things unprecedented. One after the other, new sun, day after day, things piling up until finally, just a few days ago, you heard about another. I mean, uh, dito sa Pilipinas, dito na kapit bayan na natin sa Metro Manila, Green Hills is now a ghost town, as they say, kasi merong ng nagkaroon ng uh, ng virus jan sa, sa Green Hills. Sabi niya, BGC is also a ghost town now. Then kapit bayan na natin to mga ito. Wala pa akong narinig na Antigua Center is a ghost town dahil nandito pa naman tayo. See? But all of these are happening right in our midst and right under our noses, so to speak. And if that is, if that's not a wake-up call for you, I don't know what will. The Lord's coming is soon. And you know what? According to the Bible, the next, time, the next thing in God's timetable, major event in God's timetable, We've already tackled many other passages of Scripture, the uh, coming of the Battle of Armageddon, even before that, the Battle of the Alliance of Russia and Islamic Nations against Israel. We've talked about the coming One World Church. We've talked about the Judgment Seat of Christ and eventually the coming Millennium and many other topics related to eschatology. So we're going a little bit back from our study, but yet future. We're talking about this morning the next thing in God's timetable, and that is the rapture of the saints. That's what's coming, the coming rapture of the saints. This morning, I'd like for us to see two things. First of all, the characteristics of the rapture. We've been hearing about the rapture, perhaps, and let nothing like go into the Bible and see what the Bible itself says about the rapture. We'll look at the characteristics of the rapture, and secondly, Specific challenge or challenges of the rapture. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First, let's look at our scripture reading. What does this passage... These are There are two key passages. There are more. But two key passages that give us more detail about the coming rapture is found... One of them is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice from verse 51. The Bible says, Paul was writing to believers... And what kind of Christians these believers were? The Corinthians were a carnal bunch of Christians. They were born again Christians, but they were not manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. Instead, they were still allowing the flesh to dominate them. Sadly, there was still no distinction seen between them and the non-believer. Because the non-believer is described as living in the flesh. Christians can sometimes choose to do the same, although cannot habitually because they have the Spirit of God indwelling them. But to these kinds of believers, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, Paul's letter to the Corinthians was a rebuke. It was an address to believers in Corinth who needed rebuke, stern rebuke. And after all the reading of the rebuke and lectures and instructions in the first uh, 14 chapters, then in chapter 15, I show you a mystery. A mystery in the Bible is not something spooky or scary. A mystery in the Bible is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but it's now being revealed in the New Testament. 
Now you can just imagine the Corinthian saints, they were reading the epistle, and when they come to chapter 15, I show you a mystery. Whoa, what's something? Something new. Something we've never heard from the Old Testament. It's now it's being revealed in the, in the New Testament. I show you a mystery. What is this mystery about? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, the word sleep is used sometimes in Scripture literally to refer to a person who's sleeping. Like some people, for instance, hopefully not in this church during the preaching service, you know. Some people fall asleep. Acts chapter 20, Paul preached until midnight. Do you remember that passage? As he was preaching, a guy in the third loft, we are actually in the what, third loft in Tayo, third floor Tayo, you know. Paul was preaching in the third loft, and initially air conditioned. And while Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 20, what happened? A, a man whose name is Eutychus. He was preaching long, sabi ni Luke, who, who records the incident. Hanggang he was, was already midnight. Wow. Yan tayo gusto ko kopiyan si Paul. He was preaching long until midnight. Until some people, Eutychus in particular, fell asleep and fall from the third loft. Yun ang ibig sabihin ng sleep doon, natulog talaga. Okay. But dito sa 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in some other parallel passages, the word sleep is used as a euphemism. A euphemism is simply a nice way of saying things. Instead of saying dead, the word sleep is used as a euphemism and it always is used to use a euphemism in reference to believers only. It is never used to unbelievers when the unbeliever dies, that's exactly what the Bible calls it. They're dead. But for the believer, while they're dead, Scripture uses the euphemism sleep. Parang matutulog lang tayo. Why? Because when a Christian dies, okay, his soul separates from the body, and he will meet God face to face. When the unbeliever dies, you think that's the worst? No. His soul separates from the body and goes straight to hell. Now, that's he's twice dead. Now, here's 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, In a moment, uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, Paul is saying, We're not all going to die. And who's he talking to believers? In other words, first characteristic of the rapture, it's for all believers. And by all, we mean including spiritual and carnal Christians. Paul was talking to carnal believers. Now, while we would often think that spiritual Christians are those deserving to meet Christ at the rapture, the truth is carnal Christians, spiritual Christians are not, are not deserving. None of us deserve heaven. Okay? And carnal Christians are going to be part of the rapture, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us, because Paul is addressing carnal Christians. In other words, there is no basis for the partial rapture theory. There are some who teach that. That, that the rapture, only spiritual Christians will be raptured. No. If you are a born-again child of God, you trusted Christ as Savior, then you are part of that event. It's for all believers. Now, of course, that's not to encourage Christians to remain carnal. It's simply declaring that fact. Because we are saved all because of His grace, not based on His merit. So, first characteristic, it is for all believers. Second, in verse 52, it says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. That Greek word moment is the Greek word atomos. You see that in the notes. That's where we get the English what? Atomos, it's where we get the word atom. It's from, it's a, it's from the Greek word tomnos. Tomnos means to cut with the prefix a, therefore no cut. A theist is one who believes in God, an atheist is who does not believe in God. Tomnos means to cut, atomnos means no cut, meaning you cannot cut, you cannot divide. It is indivisible, undivisible. So when the rapture happens, it's going to be instantaneous. It is going to be in a moment. That event is going to be so abrupt, so instantaneous, so that you cannot even cut time. You know, a second can cut, you can cut into a half a second and one-fourth of a second, 
when the rapture takes place, you cannot cut time or the second because it is in a moment, in other words. So it is in the smallest fraction of a second, <clears throat> so small that you cannot divide it. Can you imagine what's taking what's going to take place then? If the rapture I'm still here, I'm still, don't worry, okay? <clears throat> if the rapture were to take place, you would hardly and if you want to be sure you're part of the rapture, you better make sure you trust Christ as your Savior. So it's, an, it's interesting what's going to happen in a moment, in the smallest fraction of a second. See, sa pagalog sa isang isang mata in the twinkling of an eye. Yung nakatingin kayo sa akin, pag, pagpigit niyo, wala na si pastor ah. That is kung hindi ko pa tinatanggap si Kristo bilang tagapagligtas. Okay? Kasi pag ganun nyo, pag dilat nyo, wala na rin kayo dito, eh, hopefully, hindi ko rin kayo makikita ay ma <laughs> hindi rin ako may iwan dito. Di ba? Um, so, that's going to be, it's going to be instantaneous. Can you imagine? Babies will be part of the rapture. Amen. If you're driving the highway and then the rapture takes place, that's why it used to be there were some bumper stickers printed out, di ba? Warning, nakalang is a bumper sticker. In case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Ang problema sa mga stickers, magansang warning para magtanong ito, what is the rapture? What is he talking about? The problem is when you see that sticker in your car and then Bigla, ikaw pa yung nanguhuro na tapos na you're the one swerving. Kristiyano ba yun? Bakit nakalay yung sticker na yun? So, kaya minsan, ayaw ko nang lagay yung CD yung sticker doon. Ang ganyan eh. Nakamami sa mga, Kristiyano ba yan eh? Siya pa nagkakat ng corners and everything, etc. Nag-beat the red light and so on. So, anyway, let's, let's get back to our topic. So, it's going to be instantaneous. That's how it's going to happen. In a twinkling of an eye. Third characteristic of the rapture is going to be a transforming event. Still in 1 Corinthians 15. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality okay from corruption to incorruption this is referring to the dead believers the dead will be raised so patay na sila their bodies are in the graves but their souls are in heaven so the dead their bodies corrupting <coughs> on, on soil shall be raised so it's talking about the dead believers who are to be raised and then it says from mortality to immortality this is referring to Believers who are alive at the rapture. We have mortal bodies, but our mortal living bodies, mortal nonetheless, shall be changed from mortality to immortality. In other words, because we will be caught up. Another passage to give us more light, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. I want to make sure we check these verses so that you know that what we're giving you are directly from the texts of Scripture. Verse 20 and 21, chapter 3, Philippians. For our conduct, our conversation is in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, talking about our lowly bodies, our bodies of humiliation. He will change our vile bodies and fashion it like unto what? His glorious body, just like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's how it's going to be changed. And it says further, notice the next word, according to, that is according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. In other words, that power that will raise our dead bodies 
and change your mortal into immortal, immortal bodies is according to that power that raised Christ from the dead. It's the same power. In other words, it's according to that measure. So it shows the measure of the power that God is going to use to transform our vile bodies to fashion it after His glorious and resurrected body. And what is what was the re, what was the resurrected body of our Lord anyway? What kind of body was there? Remember, it's, it was dead. He has been crucified. He literally died, and then he was risen from the grave. And if you study those post-resurrection passages in the Gospels, you will find that his body was no more subject to sickness. There will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more limitations of time and space. Because if you look at John chapter 20, very quickly, turn to me there, please. This is the kind of body we're going to have. It's like the Lord Jesus's. John 20, verse 17 and 20, it says, Jesus said unto her, this is a post-resurrection scenario, Jesus said, touch me not. Sabi niya kay Mary, for I am not yet ascended to my father, and but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. That's what he told Mary. Wag mo hawakan, kasi hindi pa ako pumupunta sa awa. And now it's in verse 19. Then the same day at the evening. So it's the same day. Kanito, kanina it was early morning. So chapter verse 17. Now in chapter 20 verse 19. The same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut. Where the, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Came Jesus and stood in the midst of them. Now notice. Remember, this was a scenario. The, the brethren or the believers were in an upper room and they locked all their doors. Then Jesus appeared before them. But Jesus was not a phantom. He was not a ghost. He had a little physical resurrected body. Which indicates to us that that resurrected body can pass through walls. Later on in verse 24 down the line, remember when he appeared to, to uh, Doubting Thomas? Thomas was doubtful. You know why? Because that previous Sunday, he was absent. Nag absent kasi siya ng service ng Sunday before. So, umaten siya, doubting na tuloy siya, nang hina siya sa pananampalataya. Mabuti na lang umaten siya the following Sunday. Nagpakita ulit si Cristo and sabi ni Jesus, oh, hawakan mo ako. But sinabi niya kay Mary, touch me not, no? Limit pa ang hirin. Pero pagdating niya kay Thomas Tachi, ibig sabihin, nanggaling na siya sa Ama at nakabalik. So we will have glorified bodies that can pass through walls, that can travel beyond time and space and fly to heaven and earth and back. That's amazing. But wait until that day, please. <laughs> I know we're in the third floor, but uh, we're not in our glorified state, okay? So that's the kind of body we're going to have. It's going to be a transforming event. A totally changed body. Now, what kind of came to me? Say, Pastor, when I have that glorified body, am I going to look like a 17-year-old? Uh, appealing, is that your question, Mrs. Johnson? I mean, or uh, with all my you know, biceps. Well, you know what? I wish I could answer that. All I can say is that the Bible doesn't give us details as to what, what we will look like. But it's going to be an incorruptible body. See, I'm going to look at incorruptible body with this kind of skin and hair, etc. Never mind that, okay? The point is we're going to have a glorified body. Don't worry about all those other details, please. Pagdating ba natin sa rapture? Di yung mga babies pag-rapture din. Pati mga, let's say, mag-rapture. Let's say before May. Eh, si J.D. mga nganak pa sa May. So, paano yan? Eh, pati yung baby, mag-rapture na. Exactly. Kahit di pa pinag... Sabi, Pastor, somebody asked, Pastor, sa langit ba? Pag nag... Ay, mga fetus dun sa langit, magtatatako ko yung mga fetus sa langit. Ay, fetus yun, no? Mukhang anak ni. Never mind. So, anak ni! Jenny, never mind. Listen, those are kinds of interesting questions, but the Bible doesn't give us details on how to answer those.
So it is enough to know what God has revealed. Remember Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. Let's leave it there. The things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. All right, fourth characteristic of the rapture, not only it's for believers, it is instantaneous, it's a transforming event, it is a chronological event. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 52, chronological, what do we mean by that? Well, verse 51 and 52, <clears throat> the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And then verse 53, this corruptible put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, while all believers, dead and alive, will be caught up in the rapture, there is going to be a chronology. What will be the chronology? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So in other words, yung mga nangamatay na, in other words, their bodies are already in the graves, but their souls are already in heaven. Okay, They're no longer walking this earth. They will rise first. And then we, which are alive and remain on that day, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 caught up okay that's where that's what that's the word <clears throat> caught up is where is, is where we get the word rapture rapture is the word coming from the latin rapere it means to transport from one place to another that's why it was called the rapture but that's what's going to happen the dead in christ shall rise first why will they be first because they'll be coming from six feet under so, magagaling pa sila six feet under it. And habang lumalabas na sila, ha, paglabas na sila sa lupa, then we who are alive shall be caught up together. Mag-aabot din pala eh. To meet the Lord in the air. Can you imagine if the rapture took place in November 1 or October 31, when many of us will be in the cemetery? Poof! Yung mga ibang libingan, biglang nagpubungkalan. Poof! with a glorified body and it's a sunod ka rin oh hindi sana hindi ikaw yung basta naman nangyari you know hindi po ka rin naman talaga naman no hopefully that's not and if you want to be sure you better make sure you trust in Christ as your savior now it says in 1 Corinthians 15 it's at the last trump what is the last trump okay now First of all, I don't think the last trump here is referring to the last of the seven trumpet judgments that will make it the rapture at the end of the tribulation period. I don't think so. Now, there are those who have been watching the political scene in America and they say the, Lib the uh, Democrats and the, what do you call this? The, uh, well, the Republicans, uh, liberals, or the Democrats are very liberal and the Republicans are very the incumbent president is a Republican and he won and baka he is the last Trump. Okay, well, I don't think that's being referred to there too. Uh, in the end, it's President Trump. But he could be the last president. I don't know, you know. I think we should probably understand the last Trump as the last of the two trumpets that are used by Israel during the Feast of Trumpets. We find it in the, God, in the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 10. Remember, verses 1 and 2, they were going through their wilderness wanderings uh, <clears throat> as they were headed towards the promised land. And they needed sometimes to call everybody together to assemble. And then every together, everybody together to move on. They would normally blow the first trumpet. That's a trumpet call to assemble. And the second trumpet was the trumpet call to move forward, in other words. So, in other words, that's probably how we should interpret or understand the last trump there. The first trumpet is the call for the, call, for the calling of the assembly, which corresponds to the dead in Christ rising first. And then Tyrion will be caught up together. The second and the last is for the journeying of the camps. That would be the signal for the upward journey of the risen and transformed saints who shall 
That's chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians says, who shall meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be the last trump. The first trump is the calling of the assembly, the dead in Christ. Then the last trump, it's the ghost signal. It's time to journey up. And that's the purpose of that journey up is what? It's to meet him in the air. What a blessing that would be. And it's going to happen. You know why I know? Because the Bible says so. And lastly, one characteristic, one last characteristic is that it is an imminent event. We've seen that in Philippians chapter 3. They were looking for the Savior. We saw that in Titus 2.13. Paul said he was looking for that blessed hope. That was his hope, the imminent return of Christ. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Thessalonian believers were a model church. They were a model kind of believers. Why? Because in verse 10, notice in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, one of their qualities is that they were to wait. They were waiting. They were an expectant church. They were to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for his son from heaven. Now, that's exactly what the first century believers were waiting for. Then should we not all the more do the same? In other words, the imminency of the, of the, the rapture is clear proof that the rapture is pre-tribulational. Paul was looking for the Savior, not the tribulation period. Now, let's face there are believers, and they are born-again Christians, but they, are, they believe that the rapture is not pre-tribulational, but post-tribulational. The rapture will be after the tribulation. Now, I cannot somehow fit that with what I see from Scripture, because if the rapture was going to be after the tribulation, then what would you be, you and I be looking for? Sana dumating na yung Antikristo. Sana, one word, sana matake na sa isa. So that's not, we are looking for the tribulation. We're not looking for the rapture. These believers were looking for the rapture, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is the, if the first century saints looked for the tribulation period, or part of it, so that's uh, part of it, meaning mid-tribulation is there. Mid-tribulation is to believe that the rapture will take place at the middle of the tribulation, of the seven-year tribulation. And they are believers. One thing I tell you, mid-tribulation is and post-tribulation is. Maybe some of you will be watching this. I'll see you at the rapture before the tribulation period. Okay, it's Because uh, that's what we should be looking forward to. So there is no such thing as the post-tribulation or mid-tribulation because they were looking for that blessing. Besides, if you and I are looking for the tribulation, that's not a blessed hope, isn't it? What's what's the hope in that? Sana dumating na antikristo. Imbis na hinihintay mo si Cristo, hinihintay mo antikristo. That's no hope at all. See, But the believers as early as the first century were looking for that blessed hope. Okay, so that's going to happen. When? I don't know. It could be any time. Even before this message is over. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm still here. Don't worry. And like I said last week, if it doesn't come before the service is over, I can sure, sure he's going to come after the service is over. All right. But that's the challenge of the rapture. So, because his coming is imminent, and wouldn't that be an ultimate deliverance? All pain, suffering, death, coronavirus threat, paying rent, and the <coughs> medicines, and looking for all of those masks, etc. Well, none of that the problem. Not the problem. That will be the ultimate deliverance. And that's exactly what God is going to do to his saints. What a blessed hope that is. So because while we're waiting for the rapture, does God give us any specific instructions on what to do? while we're waiting for it? Yes. 
what are they? You don't have to take my word for it. I get you challenged to get to the Bible and see what the Bible... What should we be doing in the light of the any moment return of our Savior? Well, number one, I've listed, I'm, I'm using Harold Wilmington's outline here. He enumerated 10 things that we need to be doing. 10 things? Wow! That's why Jesus said, occupy. That'll keep you busy, isn't it? Occupy till you come, till I come, Jesus said. What are those 10 things? Hebrews 10, 25. Let's have it on. Okay, very quickly. So I've just finished half of my message. I have 10 more points in my message. But I'm not going to dwell on each point 10 minutes each anyway. So let's see. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Here's what the Word of God says. We are not to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So in other words, what's the A in your blank? Attend. Very good. Attend the services of the Lord. How often? Regularly. Let us not neglect the assembly. Pastor, may internet naman. Hindi assembly yan. Assembling of the brethren. That's what scripture says. Second, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. In the light of the Lord's any moment return. What are we supposed to be doing? 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Notice, until he comes. So therefore, we are to observe the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, with the rapture in mind. You say, there are two ordinances in the New Testament local church, baptism and communion. Baptism is a picture of the Lord's death, burial and resurrection. Communion is a picture of the Lord's death. But it says, the Lord's death until he comes. So we are to observe the Lord's table with the rapture in mind. So the just as it's important to be baptized after being saved, it's important to be partake of communion after being saved as well. As it is more important to be saved before partaking any of these ordinances. Number three, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. What else are we supposed to be doing while we are waiting for the Lord's return? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father at the, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So we are to be lovers or love believers in all men. Love the brethren in all men. <coughs> Show our love for brethren and for all men. What else? James chapter 5, verse 8. James 5, 8. Again, here's what the Word of God says. <clears throat> um, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That's the reason why the believers in Thessalonica endured affliction. In the, under the, all the trials that they were faced with, they were willing to endure patiently. You know why? Because of the coming of the Lord. So you and I are exhorted to do the same. Be patient. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is soon. Draweth nigh. Number five. First John chapter three, James Peter, John verse two and three. What are we exhorted to do? The Christian is to Verses 2 and 3. He, uh, first John. Okay, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Okay? So we are to live a separated or sanctified life. See, he purifies until if you are convinced thoroughly 
that Jesus is coming soon, it will have a radical impact in your life. That's one thing for sure. Because if you have this hope in you, you will purify yourself. You don't want to get caught when the Lord comes doing some kind of foolish things. Engaged in some kind of monkey business or some unconfessed sin in your life. So, we will live a separated life, purifying ourselves even as God is pure. For number 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In the light of the Lord's any moment return, sabi ni Pablo sa mga taga-Corinto, carnal Christians, for I know nothing of my, by myself, yet I am not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. In other words, Paul was faced with problems with the Corinthian saints. Why? Because these were carnal Christians who were judging his motives. Oh, the reason why Paul was an, is an apostle, he's doing it for selfish gain. He's doing it to earn more money, gain more money, etc., etc., for pride purposes. And Paul says, you are judging my motives. Listen, I preach you the word of God because God has required us to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. So in the light of the Lord's any moment return, stop judging people's motives. We cannot judge people's motives because you cannot see their motives. I cannot see yours, neither can I see mine. You can see mine. What we can see are people's actions. That we say, that's wrong. That's wrong because you see it, but motives you cannot see. Therefore, God will ultimately reveal that anyway when it got what at the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about that last week. So refrain from judging others' motives. Number six, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul says to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. In the light of his coming, kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. What does that mean? Whether you like it or not, whether you're prepared or not, in season or out of season. Preach the word, approve, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because the time will come and they will not endure sound doctrine. So we are to preach the word of God. Of course, that assumes we know the word of God. We know what to preach. What else? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We have three more points here. And we can, I've left that in your notes. You can study that, each point of it at home. So that you can be reminded, this is what God expects me to do in the light of his any moment return. Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the other passage regarding the rapture. And it says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18, wherefore, application, comfort one another with these words. So we are to comfort the bereaved with the truth of the rapture. In fact, in the context here, the believers in Thessalonica were wondering, where did the dead go? Uh, what happened when my loved one died? I don't know where they're going. They're grieving because of the loss of a loved one. Paul says, listen, there's going to be a rapture. So comfort one another with these words. How comforting is this truth? Oh, the Lord, we should talk about it. What a comfort it is to believers. To unbelievers, it's a scary thought. So tell them how they can find comfort by coming to know Christ as Savior. Uh, <clears throat> number 9, Jude, verses 21 and 20 to 23. Jude 21 to 23. Uh, what does Jude say? Verses 21 to 23. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He's talking about Christ's coming. And of some have compassion, making a difference. How do they make a difference? And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So some who made a difference, pulling out uh, people out of the fire. 
the light of their Lord standing alone could bear. In other words, they were winning souls. They were making a difference. There are pe people are dying. Going on the Sunday school, we were reminded we're all sinners by nature and by choice, and therefore deserving hell. You want to make a difference in our day? Go out, tell people how to be saved. Pull them out of the fire. Bring them to the only Savior by trusting Christ and His finished work in Calvary so that they might be saved. And finally, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, and these believers were, this if is not a hypothetical situation. This if here is considering the fact that it is true. And he's addressing believers. So it could be said, since you have been risen with Christ. And this is a description of believers. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections where? On things above. Not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. You see the problem with believers, many believers? If they're genuine believers, not only, not only does our belief change, our outlook changes, our affections change. They're redirected. Before we got saved, our affections are geared towards the things of this life. Importante, yung yumama. Sumigat. Dumami ang pera sa bangko. But once you get saved, your perspective totally changes and your affections are redirected toward things eternal rather than things temporal. So Paul is saying, set your theft affections on things above. Not the things of this life. So that when he shall appear, the praise the Lord. We shall be like him, remember. And we, and we, we shall see him as he is. Ten things that we should be occupied, do, occupied doing until the rapture takes place. Let me ask you, how are you doing? How are we? Still here. <clears throat> doing. Are we occupying? Jesus comes. See, perhaps the reason why some of us are not growing in the faith as much as we should or are living carnal lives is simply because <clears throat> our affections are directly still on the matters of this life. You are a child of God. And that, you know the reason why I enjoy talking about the rapture and the second coming? We've been talking about the subject since the year 2020 came in. Because it redirects our thoughts on things eternal. Things that are coming. I mean, this world, nothing. It's not our home. The pain, the suffering, we go to Romans 8, 18 says, all our sufferings in this life are nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Nothing. What are you going through right now as a Christian? What is it that's keeping you outside the will of God? <clears throat> what is getting you off track from the will of God? For the Christian, there should be nothing because whatever it is that's preoccupying us in this life, pagdating natin sa langit, magtataka na lang, ano ito pinagkaabalan ko ng sobra yung tao niya? Patay na patay ako sa kanya, nandun na ako sa baba. Yung pala, there's nothing. Why have I, I've been trying to acquire wealth and, and car? But then it's nothing. It's nothing. All these things are nothing compared to the things which shall be revealed. So set our affections on things above. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. The entrance of it gives light, a lamp to our feet, and light to our path. For hearing these challenges, I pray. You pray. Beginning with myself, my family, with everybody else here. Help us to be truly ready for your animal return. Heads bowed, eyes closed. With no